I have in my hand here a coffee roasted by 19 grams, a Berlin roastery, but it's from Guji, Oro Shakiso. Uh huh. This is an Ethiopian coffee. Yeah. It also happens to be where coffee comes from. You mean in the sense that Ethiopia is the birthplace of coffee? Absolutely. Ethiopia as the birthplace of coffee. So take me back in time. What does that look like? What does that mean? It means that the coffee is growing underneath the tree canopy of effectively what are often called as the cloud forests of Ethiopia. So I'm googling cloud canopy Ethiopia. Okay. And I see these beautiful kind of rolling mountains carpeted with thick dark green trees. Yeah. And these clouds whispering in between the waves of trees on the horizon. This is the kind of almost like the African version of the rainforest. The clouds up in the sky, it's shady. We've got to get plenty of moisture, plenty of rain. This is a perfect coffee place. Let's dive into the forest canopy, diving past the clouds through the canopy. And what would we see on the forest floor? I'm imagining diving down through the canopy. We're coming down through the forest leaves. We're looking underneath now the trees. We're about eight foot up. We're seeing the tops of the coffee bushes. We're seeing little straggly strands of branch, maybe a few cherries on there because this is wild coffee. This is not, you know, coffee grown in rows or anything. It's growing wild. It's doing its thing. Mm -hmm. Gradually, we're hitting the ground. We're going to see some spent fruit there. We're going to see birds who've actually picked the coffee. We'll probably pass a few birds on the way down. We might even see them, you know, spitting out the coffee or excreting the coffee bean (laughs) and thereby planting new coffee for us. (laughs) Thank you very much, birds. And if we rewind the clock thousands and thousands of years, isn't Ethiopia also the birthplace of man? That's absolutely right. Yeah. Ethiopia is the birthplace of man. We're in the Rift Valley. We're in the absolute places where the oldest humanoid skeletons have been found. So we are in the birthplace of man and the birthplace of coffee. It's really quite a special place. The birthplace of man and the birthplace of coffee. I mean, Jonathan, that's quite an interesting combination. And across these next six episodes, we're going to be exploring how mankind shaped coffee. Yeah, and indeed how coffee shaped mankind. And on the coffee side, we'll go from how, you know, we had these trees, you know, interspersed under these cloud forests in Ethiopia to parts of the world where these forests, they're ripped up and then coffee is planted systematically, row by row by row for miles over the horizon, pumped full of fertilizer, dripping with insecticide. Yes, I'm afraid that's exactly what we're going to see. I think what we're going to see is the way that coffee has changed, in some ways scarred, our environment. We're going to look at the things that humans did to get their hands on a cup of this deliciously flavored psychoactive drug, you know, caffeine. Yep. Things get dark. Things get very dark. I think the way to put it would be we're going to look at the ways that human societies exploited each other Mm. in order to satisfy that desire for coffee. It will result in enslaved Africans being thrown off ships to drown in the middle of the sea to these ginormous factories that turn, you know, coffee brown and make a handful of industrials fabulously wealthy along the way. Yeah. But Jonathan, there's also a backlash to all of this. There is. There's a backlash that starts with the kind of the ethics of coffee when we start seeing the rise of fair trade. And there's a backlash, of course, that brought you and I into the industry, James, the backlash of specialty coffee. Right. And across these six episodes, we are going to be looking at how there has been this deliciously deadly dance between coffee and humanity for 500 years. It's a fascinating dance. It shows humanity in both its best and worst lights, I would say. I'm James Harper, the creator of Filter Stories, a coffee documentary podcast. And I'm Jonathan Morris, professor of history and author of Coffee, a global history. And this is a History of Coffee, a six-episode podcast series where we explore how a tiny psychoactive seed changed the world and shapes our lives today. Now, Jonathan, in this episode, we're going to be exploring the origins of coffee before the Europeans get their hands on it. We're going to explore how a ripe red fruit growing on a tree in a forest in Ethiopia 
this red fruit gets transformed into the drink that we know today, coffee. But the kind of the interesting thing is that this transformation actually only occurs around the time that, you know, Michelangelo was carving his famous statue of David. Yeah, that's absolutely right, James. It's only the last 500 years that humans have been interacting with coffee, beginning to make it as we know today. So let's rewind the clock. Before the time of Michelangelo, let's go thousands and thousands of years back. And actually, once we evolved to be the anatomically modern humans that we are, let's say 5,000 years ago, human societies then, what would they look like and how would they interact with the coffee? So, I mean, human societies then are obviously as those, you know, hunter-gatherer type societies. So they go out into the forests, forage, bring back the berries, use the berries, use the leaves, use all parts of the tree. And for listeners who aren't aware, coffee is made from the seeds inside that cherry. Exactly right. Okay, so you're saying that we're consuming coffee, but were they drinking coffee or were they doing something else with the plant? Okay, so no, they're doing other things with the plant. So if they take the cherries, you can also kind of put the cherry, mix it in with milk or something, mix it with a bit of butter, and they would actually form these kind of balls that they would take with them as they went around the forest, which they would eat as a kind of an energy food. Wow. They're using the leaves to make a tea, kuti. So in effect, they're doing many other things, but they're not actually making coffee. It's like for thousands of years, they're just missing out on the true potential, in my opinion, of this plant. In a way, that's true. Yes. Jonathan, paint for us that picture. If we were zooming layer by layer through a coffee cherry to the bean, what does it look like? Let's slice our cherry in half. So imagine we've got the semicircle. What are we going to see? On the very outside, we're going to see the skin. Mm -hmm. Then the next leather is that kind of layer of pith. The red, gooey, mushy stuff. At the very sort of center, first we see a very, very mushy substance. This is called the mucilage, and it's adhering to what appears to be the seeds. But in fact, the seeds are wrapped in uh, what we call parchment. Mm -hmm. And it's only when we then cut through that parchment that we see that there are two seeds. Mm -hmm. They have sitting between them what is effectively feeding them. It's a little bit of a food stuff that becomes the silver skin that actually is wrapped around the seeds themselves. I see. Cherry, seeds, stones, whatever you wish to call them. What we call them is beans. So we've got our beautiful cherry. Now, what we have to do is get those beans out. Right. The way that would have been used in Ethiopia is to dry the cherry. Oh. dry the cherry until it's absolutely dried and then you literally kind of hull off the fruit mm -hmm. and you're down to the stone i see and at the end of it all you get a green bean which is then thrown into fire heat and yeah. it turns brown and then that's what you grind up add hot water and voila you have coffee that is exactly correct But Jonathan, how did people figure out that what they had to do is get the seeds in the middle, roast them up, grind them up, add hot water, and then you can drink it? Well, it's a great question, James. And of course, the answer is the great shepherd, Caldi. Caldi, huh. young man, out tending his goats in Ethiopia, sees that his goats are eating those beautiful red cherries off a bush, and then he notices, hey, these goats are dancing around. This is really huh. weird. Why is this happening? So he goes over, plucks some of those berries, and he tries some himself. And wow, Caldi feels energized. He starts doing a little bit of dancing himself. Wow. He's really amazed by this. So picks the berries, looks out for one of the elders, the sort of more religious men that he knows, mm -hmm. goes to consult with him. The religious elder is not so impressed. You know, he mm -hmm. eats it and he spits it out. Oh, But he spits it out into the fire. And it starts roasting huh. and it smells gorgeous. Huh. And they think, well, this smells really good. We've got to be able to do something with this. Right. So they gather up the roasted beans uh -huh. and they grind them up. Uh -huh. And then they think, okay, we we'll just add some water, see what happens. And gavumph, coffee. How about that? I mean, that's an extraordinary story. 
But how do we know this? I mean, do we have a record of Cowley? I mean, did he write his own memoirs or something? Well, that's the sad bit, James. Oh. We have no record of Cowley. And I think it's a pretty certain bet that Cowley never existed. I can tell oh. you where we first got this story. Oh, okay. uh, 1670 rotten, a guy called Fausto Nironi wrote the story down for us to explain the origins of coffee. It's funny, though. I mean, you see Caldi used in a lot of coffee marketing, a lot of coffee shops, roasters. Yep. So what you're kind of saying is that's a fanciful story. It's a mythical story, but I'll tell you what's fascinating about that story mm. and why we have it. It has a lot of grains of the true story of the origins of coffee in it. Huh. It's just compressed them into one simple anecdote. Mm. Okay, Jonathan, so the Caldi myth is supposed to explain, you know, how humanity discovered coffee. But of course, it's a myth. So how did it actually happen? So we've got this situation where basically coffee starts becoming traded across the Arabian Straits. Now, why is it being traded? Because there is demand for the dried fruit of the coffee cherry to make a beverage which is known as quiche. Mm. Quiche is primarily made of the dried fruit. Now, often that dried fruit would probably contain a bit of bean, probably contains the beans as well, because people aren't necessarily doing the separation. Let me just be clear about this. The cherries from these coffee trees that are in these mountainous forests, yeah. they take these cherries, they take the pips, they throw out the pips, they keep the red mushy stuff, they dry it and then sell it. No, I'm not saying that they take the pips out. I'm saying they dry the cherry whole. Ah. In the same way that today, you know, we might eat a watermelon and we can either swallow the pips or we take out the pips. Yeah, and to be honest, you know, how much care do we take preparing the watermelon? That's really the issue. And then it slowly moves east. Because geographically, Ethiopia, it's near the Horn of Africa. That's right, yeah. So it moves towards the coast. And there it's beginning to hit the trade routes. And it hits the trade routes. So tell me about the trade routes. Who's trading what? Essentially, we have a whole set of trading castes, but probably the most dominant one is actually based in Gujarat. And those are called the Banyans or the Banyans. What year is this? About the 1400s, something like that. Okay. And they are, in effect, you know, you go from one port to another mm -hmm. and you trade things in and out. So you trade spices, mm -hmm. you pick up commodities that you think you might be able to trade elsewhere and so forth. Mm -hmm. So what are they bringing to the Horn of Africa? What are they taking from the Horn of Africa? What are they taking from the Horn of Africa? I would say they're taking mostly things, yes, like coffee, like dried goods. But really what they are bringing to Africa is spice. These Gujarati traders, they unload these boxes of cardamom onto the shores of Africa. And here they get these sacks of dried coffee fruit. And then they put them into the hold of the ship. And then where do they take them? And then they're probably going to take them across the Red Sea and land them over in Arabia. Ah. Usually in Mocha. Oh. Okay, so Jonathan, I know that Kisha, you know, this tea, coffee-like drink, is very popular amongst the Sufis around this time. But one thing I always wanted to know is, actually, who are the Sufis? What they are is a form of Islam, which is quite a spiritual form. Huh. And the reason that they want to use Kisha is because it helps them in their devotions, where they use mantras and so forth to get themselves almost into a transcendental state oh. of communing spiritually. It gives them the energy they need, because the thing about the Sufis is they are not a religious order. They are people who are working everyday, ordinary people. Oh, I see. So they are meeting to perform devotions to God outside of their normal lives, but then going back to their normal lives. So if they're going to perform a night ceremony, for example, well, they've got to have something to keep them awake 
but give them the energy to get through it and get through into the next day. Mm. So this is where the Keisha comes in. Okay, so I'm going to type into Ecosia, the tree planting search engine, Sufis. Let's see what comes up. Okay. It's essentially men wearing tall cylindrical hats and they're all in white and they kind of spin around in circles with their arms outstretched. Yeah, that's right. So I'm imagining in the middle of these ceremonies, let's say it's, you know, it's two o'clock in the morning. Sufis have been dancing for hours and then they get this cup of basically caffeinated drink, which is this Keisha. Yeah. And, you know, get a gulp of this and you keep on going. Just to add for listeners who have tried cascara, the tea made with the dried coffee fruit, that's probably as near to Keisha as we've got. Mm. Certainly when I try that, I don't know about you, James, but actually I find cascara is very energizing. Let's say we're talking about, you know, the 1400s. I'm imagining, okay, coffee trees growing in Ethiopia, being picked, coffee fruit being dried and traded Gujaratis take them to Yemen and they sell them to the Sufis who use them, you know, to stay awake during these long night ceremonies. But at what point do we get coffee as I'm drinking right now? So we kind of have Keisha being the dominant thing. As the beverage becomes popular, it moves outside religious circles. It spreads up a radio. As it spreads up, so we begin to get a beginning of a separation between using the dried fruit skin, Mm -hmm. uh, which makes the classic quiche, and using purely the dried beans. And that becomes known as as bun, or later also as kava. Now, Mm -hmm. mostly when it's being made on its way up the peninsula, they start doing a little bit of light roasting. Roast the stuff in a pan before you make the drink. Mm -hmm. But by the time it gets to Turkey as part of the capital of the Ottoman Empire. By then, we're really concentrating on the bean alone, roasting the bean pretty dark. And by the time we have the descriptions of coffee in Turkey, it sounds like coffee today. Dark roasted, pulverized, add the hot water, make a beverage, which one person calls, you know, the black enemy of sleep, because we've really blackened the beans there. (laughs) So let me just be clear here. So as coffee is being drank up the Arabian Peninsula, you know, up into Turkey, where is this coffee being grown? The time that coffee arrives into Turkey is probably about the time that coffee begins to start being cultivated as a crop, not in Ethiopia, but in Yemen. In Yemen? Yeah, in Yemen. From about the 1540s, 1550s, a whole network of getting the coffee from those peasants up in the mountains down to the ports via a huge wholesale market in what we call Bait al Faka, out to then the ports of Hodouda and al Moker. Wow. Now this is different from the cultivation of coffee in Ethiopia because there coffee grows wild under forest Correct. canopy. Yeah. But this is the intentional planting of coffee for consumption. This is a whole new level. This is coffee as a commercial crop. I think to our 21st century ears, so what? You grow coffee, you put it on a ship, you sell it in another market. But this is a big deal because this is the foundations of the modern supply chain. This is absolutely the foundation of the modern supply chain, and it indeed is the modern supply chain up until really gone the 1700s. So we're talking from, you know, from the 1550s to the 1700s. All the coffee that's commercially grown is grown in Yemen, Mm -hmm. and all the world's coffee is supplied from what becomes known colloquially as mocha, because what happens is that it all, whether it's coming out of Ethiopia as, you know, dried fruits or whatever, or is coming out of Yemen, it's all going into a supply system that is run around that Red Coast Indian Ocean trading system. What you're saying is that Yemen is the Amazon distribution center of the day. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. (laughs) For coffee, at least. So, Jonathan, we're talking about Yemen being the heart of coffee production, you know, in the 1500s. 
I want to know what it tastes like. And actually, what I've done is ground up some Yemeni coffee on my trusty commandante. I put it through the sage grinder. I mean, it tastes fantastic. I'm getting like tropical fruits, butterscotch. That's some combination, isn't it? This particular coffee, it's grown by this chap from Yemen called Hassan al-Sulul. Mm-hmm. And it was roasted by friends of the show, a roastery called Darkwoods in the middle of England. Yeah, up in Huddersfield. I know them well. And what I want to know is what does coffee growing in Yemen actually look like? And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to type in the name of the village where this coffee we're tasting right now came from. So give me a sec. Operat Village Haraz. Okay, what, what have you got there, James? Oh, wow. So I'm seeing this stone structure, maybe what, three stories? Yeah. But if you zoom out of the town center, you see that it's perched right on top of a cliff top. Oh, wow. And there are these terraces where crops are growing, kind of like Chinese rice paddies, but, you know, with no water. Yeah. Plunging down from the sky here, we're looking at that wonderful village overhead and we'll be seeing flat roofs. And then we're diving down through cliffs. Mm -hmm. There's no forest canopy here. We're just plummeting right down, straight onto little steps down the side of the mountain. That's where we're planting the coffee bushes, possibly sometimes with a few bushes around them to give some kind of shade. But I mean, this is a totally different environment from our forest coffee of Ethiopia, huh? I mean, where's the water? Where's the water? Well, the water isn't going to be there very often. You know, there is a rainy period and then we have this sort of sudden runoff of water, what they call the wadis, you know, these dry streams that become suddenly torrents of water as they plunge down. Why were they growing coffee here? Were they drinking it themselves? Were they being forced to by some kind of colonial oppressor? They're growing because the people who govern the trade networks, who are mostly those Gujarati, Bunyan-type traders, they have financed a credit network that will, in effect, enable these people to grow coffee as a cash crop that can be traded down all the way, literally down the mountain, until it reaches those ports of Mocha and al Hudida. So, in effect, they are being integrated into a coffee supply chain. Right. And that coffee supply chain has all those features of finance, of trading, of numerous intermediaries, of shipping. Mm -hmm. So, Jonathan, you know, I'm tasting this Yemeni coffee and I'm getting these extraordinary tropical notes, luscious and this is where it came from. It might have even come from a terrace field, just like the one I'm looking at in this picture. Yeah. But this is what it looks like today. It looks pretty old already. I mean, 500 years ago, back in the day, when this was the coffee producing powerhouse of the world, did it look different? No. The basic scenery, the basic view of what you're seeing, no, that is how coffee growing was and is. Okay, so here's Yemen, and it's producing all this coffee. Where's it going? So it's going to coffee houses across the Arabian Peninsula, up in modern-day Turkey? Yeah, it's going that way, and it's going the other way. It's going out around the Gulf, around the Indian Ocean, what would be Persia, modern-day Iran, Iraq, etc. Where would it be drank? Can you like paint for me a picture of the kind of establishment where it would be drank? You have fantastic sort of coffee houses in the great capitals in Cairo and in what was then called Constantinople. Do we have images of those coffee houses? We've got images from about the 16th century, but mostly they're drawn by Europeans who've never actually been there. Okay, so let me get a cozier on the job. Let's see, Turkish coffee house, 15th century. Yeah, you'll see actually an image that looks not totally unlike a coffee house of today. Jonathan, I don't know what kind of coffee shops you frequent, but my coffee shops don't have indoor fountains. <laughs> but it's an extraordinary image. You have this kind of hanging lantern, these big glass windows, a lot of ornate stucco everywhere. In the corner of the room is this very opulent looking fireplace. Exactly. And I suspect that's where sort of, if not roasting, certainly brewing is taking place. Probably some roasting will be done there as well. Mm. What's kind of remarkable about this image is this does look pretty similar to my local cafe. Yeah. If you just, you know, change what they're wearing and change the opulence to like some hipster vibe. Yeah. But the idea of people hanging out and chatting over a cup of coffee, this is it in a room. You know, I mean, that is the business model that works. 
it works. We've seen that over most of history, that this business model done right is the one that works. I just want to touch on this European centricity of evidence here. Yeah. Because a lot of it seems to come from accounts by Europeans. We have plenty of Arabic manuscripts. What we don't have is the imagery. Okay. So the imagery is where we are generally using the sort of the European things, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where people have oral traditions rather than written traditions. Then again, we're very reliant on what Europeans, travelers can tell us about those traditions. So what does that mean in terms of, you know, the perspectives when it comes to telling the history of coffee? So it means if you're a professional historian as I am, then you are bound to be very critical and careful about your sources. I'd like to jump back into Yemen. Okay, so here are these coffee houses and these Egyptian men are enjoying their Arabic style coffee. And that coffee is almost certainly from Yemen. Yeah. Now, take me to the port of Mocha, the giant warehouse of global coffee at this point in time. Who's running the trade? Those Gujaratis who are organizing the trade are actually incredibly wealthy again. Hmm. So the ships that go to Mocha usually have on them a person who's not necessarily the owner of the ship, but is the kind of the businessman in control. Mm -hmm. There are great ceremonies when these people arrive and come. They dress up in fantastic outfits. They have five gun salutes fired off from the port. Hold on. So you're saying that when a ship from Gujarati traders sails into the port of Mocha in Yemen, they get a five gun salute? Why? because they're so important. These guys are bringing wealth and they're creating wealth and they're taking wealth and they need to be treated as honored guests. Huh. There's stuff about sort of, you know, some ships, if they only got three guns, wouldn't come in. Wow. You know, they want the whole five gun or whatever, <laughs> you know, so that there's a real... What? It's absolutely true. Paid for me, what does the port even look like? You said a five-gun salute. Where are these cannons? We have one image of Mocha, which again is an image that is created from... Let me guess, a European interpretation. A European interpretation. It's a Dutch interpretation. <laughs> well, let's have a look. So in the backdrop, you have these big, beautiful mountains. Along the shore, you have what looks like a lot of minarets, spires, forts, flags... And I see fortifications too. Yeah, exactly. And then in the foreground, you have these very choppy waters and what, I don't know, a dozen or so ships sailing in. This was a very, very, very prosperous port. Of course, they were protected and had fortifications. You know, these were places with a lot of gold. And I think you can see that because the minarets, I see minarets where I live in Berlin, but these are much taller than them. These tower, what, my fault, looks like 50 metres in the, into the air. They're huge. They certainly are. Now, whether that's realistic, there are all of those minarets. I see. But it's not that exaggerated. So if you Google up some images of current day Mocha and you'll Google up Merchant's House Mocha. Let's do that right now. Let's do it. Yeah. M-O-K-H-A. Okay, so you have this building, which is not dissimilar to what looks like a Venetian palace. And it's sitting on sand, slightly at an angle, and completely boarded up. But there are columns. Exactly. Chiseled stone. Yeah. Tell you what, Jonathan, I wouldn't mind living in a house like that. Yeah, I would be very happy to live in a house like that. So this would belong to the kind of people who were the import-exporter merchants. These are people who are well off, to be blunt. Mm. But it gives you a sense of what the prosperity of Mocha was. This is a rich port. But Jonathan, I know that today, <laughs> the port of Hamoka looks rather different. Let me just quickly search this in Ecosia. Yeah. All right, so Jonathan, I can count maybe six rusty fishing vessels. Yeah. A few containers and not a lot going on. Very little going on. It's a, such a far cry from the prosperity and the wealth and the busyness of that previous image. 
Okay, so let's freeze frame in 1600. Okay. So if you were in Egypt at that time, if you're in Turkey, when you went to your coffee house and you took a sip, that was grown by a Yemeni farmer. Almost certainly. Today, when we pick up a coffee, a generic coffee, say down our local cafe, what is the chance that that coffee is from Yemen? 0.001%, I should think. Wow. That's almost a rounding error. That is a rounding error. In effect, for many years, it has been treated as a rounding error. So what shifted to make that the case? How did Yemen go from this point of total coffee producing dominance to being a rounding error? There are two reasons, James. One is the terrain. Obviously, there's just a very limited amount of land that can be used for growing coffees. Mm -hmm. One of the things that really frustrated coffee traders was, you know, it's actually very difficult to get a lot of coffee out of Yemen. Right. So there are stories of people who went to Mocha and tied up their ship and they would take months, maybe years to acquire enough coffee to fill the ship. <laughs> oh yeah, because it, because this is really difficult to do because there's only so much coffee around. It's very rare that we see Yemeni coffee. And again, you know, this coffee that we're drinking, it's fantastic that we've actually just got it. Because, of course, the political situation in Yemen is such that it's highly disruptive to trade. And in fact, if we think about it now, or the coffee areas that we talk about, so we've been talking about Mocha, Al Haduda, Sana, the coffee growing areas, these are all currently under Houthi control within the context of the current civil war in Yemen. Mm -hmm. So it's incredibly difficult for people to actually trade normally when you have a civil war going on. And there have been mm. innumerable conflicts over the years in Yemen between all kinds of parties, frequently basically a set of proxy wars between two powers, which is just what we have going on right now. Yes, Iran and Saudi Arabia. Exactly, yes. Mm -hmm. And all the while, the coffee sits there on the mountain slope, growing like it has done for hundreds and hundreds of years. So for over 100 years, Yemen is this coffee-growing powerhouse, and it's being shipped across the world, mostly by Arabic and Gujarati traders. And the Ottomans, who dominate the peninsula at the time, are making a lot of money out of this. They made sure that the coffees were so dried out that you couldn't grow coffee from the beans. Yeah. So how was that stranglehold broken? Who broke it? Ultimately by the Dutch. And that's shortly soon afterwards followed by the French etc etc and a lot of colonization a lot of colonization coffee becomes a colonial product basically a colonial good it ushers in the use of forced labor in the production of this drink and the deaths of many people as we go into that next phase i think where people refer to coffee as having a dark history this is where the dark history is really comes to the fore we'll see the spread of coffee around the world being accompanied by significant problems that go way beyond the problems of economic inequality, but go to the heart of freedom and the heart of what we have done in the name of commodity production. That is what we'll cover in the next episode. But before we get to the next episode, I do have one final question. Jonathan, just taking a step back here. Coffee was growing in Ethiopia wild for thousands of years. And here you have Yemen trading with the Gujaratis, trading with the Dutch. And it just seems like a lot of activity, a lot of big power play happening by the big powers at the time. And meanwhile, over in Ethiopia, like what's going on? Is coffee still important in Ethiopian society? Let's go back to that cloud forest. So, Kaffa mm -hmm. is a kingdom. It's its own kingdom. It has its own sort of set of religions and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, people in Kaffa, when they go and pick the coffee, they will often make some kind of sacrifice to the coffee or something to acknowledge the forest spirits that look after the coffee. Hmm. So, they might, when they drink coffee, pour a little bit of coffee onto the ground as a way of sort of acknowledging that it came from the ground. Sometimes when they go and harvest, they will sacrifice something like a chicken. Mm -hmm. But there's a story about Kaffa that really 
brings this home, and that is about, in 1890, the burial of the last independent king of Kaffa. When the king dies, his remains are taken to the forest for burial, and with him buried the things that he will need in his afterlife. And into his grave, well, they put various things. They take a slave, and I'm afraid they slaughter the slave, boy, and put the slave into the grave. They also put in coffee and coffee cups. And that sort of somehow sums up the centrality of coffee in Kaffa. That is what's going on back in Ethiopia. Wow. So much history bundled into such a simple drink. You know, the great thing, if I could say as a finishing thought, James, is, you know, to anyone listening to this podcast, try Ethiopian coffee, try Yemeni coffee, because that is drinking your original coffee. That is drinking coffee history. So, thank you for listening for A History of Coffee, the first episode in our podcast series. The next couple of episodes are already out, but not on the Filter Stories channel, on the A History of Coffee podcast channel itself. And I've put a link in the show notes to that. And if you click subscribe, you will also automatically download the second batch of episodes when they drop in a couple of weeks. But, you know, there are so many great stories we didn't actually have time to cover, James. Mm. The really good news is that we're going to appear at the Barista League's high-density virtual free conference. Something for basically coffee people, but anybody interested in coffee. So we are going to be exploring coffee myths. And of course, we already mentioned one of them, Kaldi. Yeah. But there are a few others, too. If you are in the specialty coffee world, you're very familiar of The Waves. So we'll be <clears throat> uh, disentangling, let's say, that myth. I'm uh, looking forward the myth- to that. <laughs> There's also the myth around Baba Boudin and his seven seeds, which comes up in the next episode. So the next time your barista says something to you around the origins of coffee, you may actually be in a more informed place. That's true. And if you are a barista, the reverse applies. You can educate your customers. There we go. James, we've put up some illustrations as well. You've described some of the scenery that we've been looking at. We've been flying over places. But, you know, for those of you who really want to get a true sense of it, on my Instagram feed and my Twitter feed, which is at Coffee History JM, I'm posting images from Ethiopia, which have kind of been given to me by Colin Smith of Coffee Origin Trips, including ones of tributes to Cowley. And I believe you've got some stuff up too. Yeah, on my Instagram, which is at Filter Stories Podcast. You know, those beautiful coffee terraces in Yemen. Yeah, and the white houses and the flat roofs. Yeah. So I'll be putting some of those images on my Instagram so you can see what coffee growing looked like in the past and frankly still looks like in Yemen. I already, of course, have up on my sites a link to Coffee A Global History, my book. Now, this podcast was produced by myself and you, Jonathan. I wrote and played the piano music. And if you like the show and you want to help others find this show, the best thing you can do, obviously tell a friend and also leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Well, there we go. Looking forward to you downloading the next episode. Don't forget to press that subscribe button and we will speak again there. Catch you at the next episode. Mm